This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In 1970, Clarence Roberts was found dead in a fire. Or was he? Ten years later, another fire killed his wife. In the rubble, Clarence Roberts was found for the second time. How could a man die twice? Pretty 16-year-old Jenny Pratt hoped to become a model until tragically she and her boyfriend were viciously attacked on a deserted road. She was in a coma for three months and still has no memory of the attack or her attacker. In Central Florida, a clumsy robber has successfully held up 30 banks. The police call him Fumbles. He is still at large. On a quiet Saturday morning, Jack Quinn went to work and calmly walked off with $1.3 million. He seems to have committed the perfect crime. Perhaps tonight, you can help catch him. For every mystery, there is someone somewhere who knows the truth. Tonight, we'll tell you how our viewers helped capture a Tennessee man accused of murdering two teenage girls. Ten years ago, he fled to Canada. After our broadcast, he is now in custody. Join me. You may be able to help solve a mystery. During the spring of 1987, Jenny Pratt had hopes of becoming a model. She was pretty, popular, and in her sophomore year at a Carlsbad, California high school. But what mattered most to Jenny was her boyfriend, Curtis Croft. Jenny was only 16, and she was deeply in love with Curtis. He drove a Porsche, had plenty of money, and was a good-looking California surfer. But Curtis's glamorous facade had a darker side. I didn't really, really know what was going on until I'd say almost six months into the relationship when she said, Mom, I have a boyfriend, he's 17 years old. And I said, OK. And he really seemed like a, a, a pretty nice boy. In fact, he, he really did a good job snowing me. He looked 17. And further on down the road, I found out, you know, he had been in jail for drugs. And um, he was 24 years old and just bad news for a 16-year-old kid. Against her parents' wishes, Jenny went out with Curtis on the night of April the 25th, 1987. He borrowed a friend's motorcycle and promised Jenny he would get her home before her midnight curfew. Jenny Pratt would never arrive home that night. Jennifer Pratt was brutally attacked that April night with an unusual weapon, a heavy board six and a half feet long. The police believe that her assailants may be local teenagers, but so far no one in the community will speak out to identify them. We will not know who attacked Jenny until someone has the courage to step forward with the truth. At 1 a.m. on the night of the incident, Jenny's parents received a telephone call. Their daughter had been airlifted to a nearby hospital. They said, your daughter's been in an accident. I said, is she OK? And they wouldn't tell me anything. And they said, you know, you'll have to come down. She's in Scripps in La Jolla. I didn't even know where it was. Neither one of us realized why she would be going to Scripps Hospital. There's a hospital five minutes away. Oh, my gosh, I hope she's Scripps be Medical okay. Center in La Jolla, California, is a renowned trauma center which takes only the most severe Hi, cases. Her. her name is Jenny Pratt. Can we see her? Um, no, you can't see her right now. The doctor's with her. Is she OK? I, I was asking, you know, a million questions, but I wasn't getting any answers. 
finally, um, the nurse said uh, the doctor would like to talk to us, and he took us off into kind of a waiting room. The doctor told Jenny's parents the worst possible news. Your daughter is brain dead, and we don't expect her to live. Jenny had received a very serious injury at the uh, scene of the accident. The blow from the board that struck her was great enough to actually crush the skull, and that caused an immediate uh, shutdown of her brain. And then they said I could see her, and what I saw was horrible. Her hair was red from all the blood. She was bleeding out of her nose, her ears, her mouth. She had tubes all over her. And it was like her whole body was just distorted. Miraculously, Jenny Pratt survived, but she lapsed into a deep coma. Our first uh, involvement in the case was to examine the evidence that was found at the crime scene, which consisted of the two by four that was used to, to hit Jenny and Curtis. So we examined that for physical evidence and didn't find any fingerprints. There were some blood stains on it which uh, were photographed and were determined to be Jenny's. Curtis was interviewed that same day at the Carlsbad Police Station. His account of what happened uh, basically is that he was giving Jennifer a ride home. They were driving down Rancho Santa Fe Road, getting to, ready to make a left turn. I was just like going, just approaching the intersection, going real pretty slow. And all of a sudden something struck me and I just go, ow, what was that? It's like, I just kind of hurt it really bad and then the car the car went zooming by and I went back I turn around and tell Jenny I go someone threw something at me or something you know I don't know what happened something hit me I'm just you know I couldn't believe it, it hurt and she was out of it and so I just go oh my god what's happening uh, we believed it was a case where a car load or a truck load of juveniles had committed this crime Curtis was giving Jennifer a ride home they had almost come to a complete stop when he realized that he had been struck by a board and realized that Jenny had been struck by a board and had slumped against him. At the same time, the white pickup truck went by them at a high rate of speed. He had the impression that there was a large group of juveniles in the back of the pickup truck, that they were laughing as they went by, and his impression was that the board came flying from the pickup truck. Quite frankly, we expected it to be a crime that would have been solved just by the nature of juveniles have a tendency to talk. We felt it was very possible that in a short period of time, we would have identified who the suspects were. But to this date, we have yet to have anybody come up and supply us with any direct knowledge of what happened that night. I understand you're a friend of Jenny's John. parents hired private investigator Louis Crisafi. He interviewed students at Jenny's high school. Basically, all I can tell you is at that night that happened, it was not aimed for Jenny, it was aimed for Curtis. And Nobody know, really knows who did it. I have a feeling I know who did it, but no one's really willing to say. There's no doubt that there were people, because of Curtis's background, that didn't like him. He was not a popular person. In 1985, Curtis Croft had been convicted for dealing cocaine. After cooperating with police investigators, he served less than half of his sentence. He developed a reputation as a snitch when he got himself in trouble. And uh, young people, particularly young people involved in drugs, tend to look down on somebody who develops that reputation. Police investigated a number of people who might have wanted to hurt Curtis. Hey, get out here. They learned that Curtis had confronted one of his enemies on the night before the assault. You stole some stuff from my apartment the other night. I didn't steal anything from your apartment. Yeah, you did. You know exactly what I'm talking about, too. No, Jenny's like parents girlfriend. believed that the boy might have attacked Curtis and Jenny because of Curtis's threats against him. I have to to get you. Good. Yeah. I'll talk to them, too. Yeah, you're busted, man. No, I don't think so. Yeah, you are. The police investigation was stopped cold when Curtis claimed he could not identify the perpetrators on the night of the incident. He said the white pickup truck was traveling at 55 miles per hour, too fast for him to get a look at Jenny's assailants. Louis Crisafi did not believe Curtis. He attempted to reconstruct the incident at two different speeds. And we used the identical pickups uh, as far as the model year and the size and the same type of motorcycle, and we used the same conditions. The first reconstruction was done at 50 miles an hour. At that speed, it seems almost certain that both Curtis and Jenny would have been killed 
Moreover, in this reconstruction, the board fell about 50 feet from the scene of the crime, when in reality, police had found it only a few feet from the spot where Jenny had been attacked. The second reconstruction, played out at only 10 miles an hour, inflicted injuries very similar to the ones Curtis and Jenny actually received. This is a perfect depiction of exactly And this time, the board fell right next to the motorcycle. wound up almost identical to where it was. We had reason to believe that Curtis was not telling the whole truth. We went back to Curtis's apartment and visited with him. Are you prepared to make a Krasavi felt that Curtis had seen the people in the pickup truck, and he confronted him. Were you in a fight that evening in the restaurant? Finally, Curtis did name names. One of them was the same boy he had fought with on the night before the attack. They, like, forced me to tell. They, like, it's like threatening someone, you know? And they, like, scared me into saying that, and that wasn't right. Okay, Curtis, you've made some new statements to the private investigators, and I want to hear what those statements were. Later on, Curtis recanted, telling police he had given them names because he felt pressured. I was a little nervous, and I The truck pressured. went by really fast, and the people yeah, try to say, oh, maybe you know, saw someone, but I really didn't. And we've done lying detector tests on me. I've passed everything, you know, I've told the truth. I've always been there to help. I've never, you know, not came around. I've always came to everything he's wanted me to do and cooperated with everything. We do believe that Curtis did, in fact, see those people. Curtis continuously told us that he has been threatened, that uh, he has uh, basically informed on people before and was very, very frightened that he would be killed and he was already being threatened not to talk in this case. And we have reason to believe that what he's saying to that effect is true. You know, the real mystery is, it seems like the second we find somebody that's willing to come forward and say something, somebody gets to them and they either disappear or they don't know anything. I honestly believe people have been paid off, threatened, and if anybody does try to come forward, the next day they don't want to do it. You know, people's mind don't change that fast. Three months after the attack, Jenny Pratt came out of her coma. At first, she seemed incapable of thought or action. But after 12 weeks, she started physical Good. therapy. This time we're going to take a step off of, off Seven of months later, Jenny began to speak. A year later, she walked. Okay, spaghetti. Jen, I want you to try and take a step with this leg. Keep the whole foot on the ground. Although Jenny's progress has been miraculous, her brain damage is severe, and tragically, it is probably irreversible. I don't think it's possible that those events were stored in her memory. I don't think there's any way they can be recalled. I think there's a strong likelihood that she could be told things that she would then repeat. But to remember those actual events is virtually impossible. I'm wondering that about why somebody was trying to kill me. Why was somebody mad at me? What did I do to them to hurt them? We need somebody in the community with half the courage of Jennifer Pratt. Somebody who just knows the one missing link, the one thing that'll tie this whole case together, because I really think that's all we're missing, is a one small link, and someone out there has it. We've emphasized repeatedly over the last year, year and a half, that we're primarily in, interested in finding who threw the board that hit Jenny. If there's a group of other people in the truck, they can come forward without fear of prosecution. I see a lot of hard work, needless work that had to be done, because some fool did this to her. A brain injury you live with that for the rest of your life. And I sometimes wonder if it is living, really. I'll always love Jenny, but I sure miss the old Jenny. If anybody in this state could tell me who hurting me, I would appreciate that very badly. Because you don't know how bad I would appreciate the feeling that somebody does love me and somebody does really care about me. 
Last October, we examined the case of Joe Shepard, wanted by the FBI and Tennessee police for the murders of 14-year-old Kathy Clowers and 16-year-old Roxanne Woodson. Police allege that in both cases, Shepard brutally murdered his victims and then buried their bodies in shallow graves. In 1978, Joe Shepard was officially charged with the two murders. On July 17th of that same year, while awaiting trial in the Bradley County Jail, Joe Shepard and two other inmates escaped. Although his two accomplices were recaptured the following week, Joe Shepard was never found. Update, London, Ontario, Canada. A 10-year search for Joe Shepard has ended. After the Unsolved Mystery Show on October the 5th, we received a phone call from a local resident saying that he believed the guy called Shepard was in fact living in London under the name Joseph Tripp. We began an investigation, and when we had identified him to our satisfaction as Shepard, he was arrested. At the time of his arrest, Shepard was living in a government housing project in London, Ontario, with his common law wife and their two children. It seems apparent that Mr. Shepard was in London, Canada, with just within a matter of days after his escape from Bradley County. Shepard is currently in custody on an immigration warrant and is awaiting deportation back to the United States. However, the U.S.-Canadian extradition treaty stipulates that he cannot be returned to a state that plans to invoke the death penalty. And I can tell you that it is my intention to seek the death penalty on Mr. Shepard unless it would prevent his extradition to the state of Tennessee. Shepard also faces seven other charges, including rape, aggravated assault against a police officer, and escape from jail. Next, the story of Jack Quinn, trusted vice president of a security firm. He stole $1,300,000 in untraceable cash. One Saturday morning, Jack Quinn calmly walked off the job with $1,315,000 in untraceable cash. He still remains at large. Jack Quinn was vice president and general manager of Federal Protection Services, a company that provided security and armed guards to banks and other financial institutions. Every day, this company handled millions of dollars in cash, and Quinn oversaw the firm's security operation. No problem, boss. No problem. At 8 a.m. on Saturday, April 9, 1988, Jack Quinn arrived at his office. Few people were at Federal's office that day, though a supervisor, Harry Goldberg, was working that morning. Morning, Harry. Morning, Jack. I'm going to take care of the morning run. OK. While Harry continued to work at his desk, Quinn was busy too. But he kept his business to himself. From time to time, Harry Goldberg would see Quinn in the vault, but he noticed nothing unusual. I'd walk down the hall several times, pick up coffee or whatever, and every time I'd go past that window, I'd look in and see him sitting at the desk, just as calm, cool, and collected as you'd ever want to see him. I never suspected he would be doing something like that. I don't even know how he had the time. It would take him 20 minutes to pack up the money, loose money. If it was loose and some bags, it would take maybe a half hour, 45 minutes. Somehow, without being detected, Quinn spent much of the morning in the vault transferring the money from bags to boxes. Outside, Quinn put the money into the trunk of his company car. Quinn also put $107,000 into the trunk of his personal car. He then asked Harry Goldberg to follow him home. When he arrived, Quinn dropped off his car and said goodbye to his wife. Nothing. I have to get back to the office. I'll be about a half hour or so. Okay? Sure. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
How's this car doing? Not too bad. It could be better. What do you mean, could be better? Harry Goldberg drove Quinn back to the office. Quinn got into the company car that now held over a million dollars and headed to the airport. Police speculate that he had transferred the money into suitcases. When he arrived at the airport, he unloaded his car and vanished. The trail for Quinn stops at Palm Beach International Airport. The ticket in the car indicates it was left there at 5.36 p.m. on the night of the 9th. From that point, we have no idea where Mr. Quinn has gone. Indications are he did not take a plane, he did not rent a car, and he did not take a cab. Jack dropped the car keys off to me a while ago, and he said he'd be back in half an hour. And that was five hours ago. When her husband failed to come home, Quinn's wife called his office. They had no idea where he was or what he had done. The next morning, she found $107,000 in the trunk of their car. She turned it into the police. She also found a letter that read in part, I have done something very wrong and I can't stay and face the consequences. The monies that Quinn left Federal Protection Service with that Saturday night are untraceable. There are no pre-recorded serial numbers. There are no bait bills. The monies are of a varied denomination and basically can never be traced to him. Since the investigation began, it appears that Quinn may have been involved in several what we call defalcations, missing money, mysterious disappearances from the company prior to this uh, culminating incident. Uh, there was an incident approximately a month prior to his leaving where his wife had found a wad of money in the vehicle, his personal vehicle, and it was unexplained. Whenever the wife would find money, be it in the car, in the house, and so forth, Quinn would explain it away as he had sold something, a gun, a car, its old property, and that would explain his acclimation of the money. Quinn was known to appreciate the good life. He rented a 10-acre horse ranch. Friends wondered how he could afford this extravagant lifestyle on his $35,000 a year income. Several weeks prior to this theft, uh, we learned that the IRS was after Jack Quinn to settle a substantial amount of money. Uh, Jack did not have the money. And it was quite obvious to me that the reason he pulled this job is because he had no other way of satisfying the IRS. He was going to lose everything or possibly go to jail. There were reports that Quinn had been conducting an ongoing affair. A month prior to the theft, Quinn would leave home at 5 a.m., yet not arrive at work until 9.30. Police speculate he used the time to see his girlfriend. They also speculate that they may have run away together. Whatever the reasons for his disappearance, today Jack Quinn is a wanted man. He is 48 years of age. He is stocky with a tendency to put on weight. He has thinning brown hair, brown eyes, and is fluent in Spanish. Next, the story of two fires in a tiny Indiana town called Nashville. They happened 10 years apart. Yet the body of Clarence Roberts seems to have been found both times. Some people in Nashville believe he is still alive. Nashville, Indiana. Population 700. Located in the American heartland, Nashville is like a Norman Rockwell painting brought to life. Here, everyone knows one another. So there are a few street addresses and fewer secrets. Nashville is a community in the best sense of the word. Two of Nashville's most illustrious citizens were Clarence and Geneva Roberts. But in the fall of 1970, the couple became embroiled in a firestorm of controversy, betrayal, and murder. On the night of November 18, 1970, a fire raged out of control behind the Roberts' fashionable home. And when the ashes had cooled, a body was discovered and identified as Clarence Roberts. Ten years later, another fire blazed. Two more bodies were discovered. One was Geneva Roberts, 
and the other was again identified as Clarence Roberts. But how could a man die twice? Today, the people of Nashville still wonder what happened to Clarence Roberts. I talked to both detectives uh, that was on the second fire, and from what they told me, I'd say it was definitely Clarence. I still think Clarence died in the first fire. I don't think Clarence Roberts died in the second fire. I, I just don't believe that. I think Clarence is still alive. I sure do. The mystery of Clarence Roberts' death still haunts those who knew him. In the 1960s, he embodied the American dream. A former sheriff, a board member of the Nashville State Bank, he seemed to have it all. But something went wrong for Clarence. His dreams became twisted into a nightmare saga that has gone on for 18 years and still continues today. In the 1960s, Clarence owned a prosperous hardware store along with his brother Carson. Clarence was well respected, everyone's friend. He and I worked together for about 22 years. Clarence always seemed to be pretty happy. He enjoyed working. Clarence was outgoing, he was friendly, and always made friends with people, and always got along with people. Well, I'll tell you what, you probably want to use one of these for the shelving, and I've got some good fencing in the back. Clarence worked hard, and he put a lot of hours in when he was younger. Clarence, uh, uh, you know, he would help anyone. He would help you or anybody if you thought she was in need. Clarence and Geneva had been married since 1941. Geneva came from a poor family, but together she and Clarence rose in Nashville society. With four sons and a successful family business, the Roberts seemed to be the perfect couple. He soon reached the 33rd degree of the Masons, a rank commemorated by this ring, which he wore proudly. Clarence's appetite for the good life began to consume him. He purchased three luxury cars and an expensive and fashionable home. But behind this facade of wealth were heavy debts. Clarence changed a lot. He really did. I really can't describe how different he would be. It's like um, turning a light on and turning a light off. That was Clarence turned the light off. To finance his extravagant lifestyle, Clarence sold his hardware business and gambled everything on two property investments, an apartment building and several grain elevators. These investments failed. And by the fall of 1970, Clarence Roberts knew he was in serious trouble. For all the money that he was losing, everything going down the drain, he was going for a millionaire or broke. And he was ending up broke. He was trying to pull out of it. Yeah, Warren, I can see that you come after the cars. There go the guys getting ready to jump in and drive them away. In October 1970, one month before the first fire, Clarence and Geneva stood by as Sheriff Warren Roberts, Clarence's own brother, repossessed two of his vehicles. Thanks a lot. Clarence and Geneva were left desolate and desperate. He wasn't the Clarence that I had always been used to being around. He was down. He was really depressed, and I feel that he was suicidal. At 6.20 p.m. on the night of November 18, 1970, firemen arrived to find the garage barn of the Roberts' home ablaze. The heat was so intense that they stood helplessly by as the structure burned to the ground. When the fire had cooled, they made a grisly discovery. Come back here, I think we got a body. A body, burned beyond recognition, lay beneath the rubble, a half-melted shotgun by its side. The body was so badly burned, it was difficult to identify it as human. Jack Bond, the county coroner, feared that Clarence Roberts had finally paid his debts by taking his own life. When we found the body, why, we thought he'd shot himself. There wasn't much doubt in our minds that he just got too many worries ahead of him and he committed suicide. 
So when we got back down to the funeral home, why, we started looking for shots. And uh, we couldn't find any. The police wondered how Clarence's suicide could have been accomplished without a gunshot wound. Detective Don Cooster sifted through the debris. Hidden in the ashes, he found Clarence's Masonic ring. Despite the intense heat, it was virtually undamaged. The ring, when it was found, was in excellent shape. The ring definitely had no damage as far as melting or anything on it. There's no way that ring could have withstood the heat of that fire like it did and not even have a damaged part on it at all. I definitely think the ring was a plant. Uh, it, it just, it had to be. It had to be. This was only the first of a series of unusual discoveries. Investigators learned that only months before the fire, Clarence had purchased several insurance policies on his life, totaling close to a million dollars. In addition, a test showed that the body found in the blaze had type AB blood. Clarence's blood type was B. If it wasn't the body of Clarence Roberts, then who died in the fire? Two days before the blaze, Clarence was spotted in a bar in the nearby community of Morgantown, befriending a vagrant. Uh, he'd been seen on the 17th of November, 1970. And from the witness, uh, he was described, he was about 5'7 to 5'9. And he was uh, about the same age as Clarence. And Clarence was with him, but he didn't know his name. I got some grass needs cutting, a little brush needs trimming out the house. Would you be interested? Yeah. We'll get in the car and we'll go. Come on. As they were leaving, a man collapsed hey, hey, hey. from some unknown cause. Sit. Clarence said he'd take him to the hospital. And Clarence left with him. And later on, I checked the hospitals within a 300-mile radius, and this man was not admitted to a hospital. Two theories divided Nashville. One, that Clarence had killed himself. And second, that he murdered the vacant in order to collect the insurance money. It is even claimed he watched from the woods as the flames destroyed the evidence of his crime. Suicidal? Yes. But to commit murder? No way. I can't believe he could have been any part of that. It must be hard, be beyond my wildest imagination to think that Clarence Roberts could ever have been involved with anything like that. Definitely. Definitely, he was capable of it. Clarence was either dead or missing. And Geneva Roberts was left alone, her fortune changing dramatically from riches back to rags. She was forced to move to the outskirts of town, and her claims to the insurance money were repeatedly denied. Geneva was not alone in maintaining that Clarence had died in the first fire. John Pless, a prominent pathologist, agreed with her. It wasn't until 1978 that the attorneys came to me to review the reports of the experts who'd examined the evidence. And in the process, I was able to prove to myself and to a lot of other people that the body that was found in that garage was Clarence. Approach the bench. And I testified at the time of the civil trial against the insurance companies that I felt it was highly probable that it was Clarence Roberts. Mrs. Roberts, you have lost your case against the insurance company. We have only the recourse of an appeal. Despite Dr. Pless's testimony, Geneva lost all of her appeals. The people that I was involved with in that trial were decimated emotionally by the judge's ruling. I couldn't realize why the judge had made the ruling he had. These denials took their toll on Geneva. Withdrawing from her friends and neighbors, she became the subject of local gossip. In order to make ends meet, Geneva had to take a job in the kitchen of a local restaurant. Then the rumors began. Local shopkeepers said that they had sold her large quantities of beer, 
surprising considering Geneva was a diabetic and seldom drank beer. Some said Geneva was not alone, and neighbors began to report seeing someone on the grounds of Geneva's home. We had developed information that a man had been seen behind Geneva's residence. The man acted very strangely. He would never let anyone get close to him, and he always seemed to duck away from them and head back toward the house immediately. Myself and some other officers set up a surveillance. We were down there for approximately three days and three nights. We were photographing everyone coming and going in and around Geneva's house. They saw nothing, but they knew who they were looking for. I'm sure that was probably Clarence. I think he had perhaps run out of places to go, you know, and he had come back uh, to staying with Geneva. He was the mysterious man that was seen behind her house. A local reporter, Helen Ayers, had grown friendly with Geneva. She felt that Geneva was hiding something or someone. I stopped at her house probably four or five different times, and she always met me at the back porch and would never invite me in. And most people do. I mean, around here, it's just a matter of courtesy to ask you to step inside. But she never did that. And it kind of made me suspect there might be a man living in there. Hi, Helen. How are you today? I'm fine. I interviewed I Clarence's sister, who lived in the adjacent yard there. And she said that she could hear Geneva talking to this man. And she said it definitely was not Clarence's voice. Nobody knows for certain what Geneva Roberts was trying to hide, or whom. A reclusive life went on uneventfully until the night of November 18th, 1980. When my office called and explained that it was Geneva's house on fire and that they thought Geneva was still inside the house, I went right to the fire scene and the fire was still burning you know, very intensely at that time. After the fire was extinguished, why, we just stayed behind, and I'm not even sure why. Um, I just wanted to look further, uh, as did, I'm sure, the, the firemen. Sifting through the ashes, searchers found the body of Geneva Roberts, Hours later, they made another shocking discovery. Geneva's body had been removed to the funeral home, and the fire had been extinguished. The house was totally demolished. So we'd gone through the rubble, and a fireman had located a second body in another part of the house. And I was just so certain that it would be that of Clarence. I didn't even have to have the comparison films. I knew the bony configuration of Clarence Roberts so well that I recognized him immediately by his chest x-ray. Um, now I knew that I was going to have a difficult time to tell uh, all of my friends and neighbors in the world that Clarence was dead for the second time. It just... Um turned out to be Clarence, and I, and I was very pleased with that, uh, that this might be coming to an end. A little did I know that it was just starting. <laughs> this was definitely a set fire caused by an accelerant. It looks like that someone just came in the back door and poured all the way around the walls. The second fire was a clear-cut case of arson. We could follow very clearly these burn patterns from Geneva's bed into the adjacent room where Clarence's body was located, and then down a hallway and out the back door of that house. So we determined right there that at least Geneva had been murdered. We're sure that turpentine was used to ignite this fire. We know that. We simply don't know who started it whether it was Clarence that started the fire or uh, that of a third party. 
You know, I subscribe to the, the theory of a third party. Investigators have no clue as to who set this second fire, but they believe they have identified the victim. So I'm absolutely convinced that the second victim, the victim in the second fire, is that of Clarence Roberts. There's just no doubt in my mind. There's not a doubt in my mind at all. I still would like to know who the second body was, because I still can't believe it was Clarence. Pathologist says it is. So. But I still don't, me personally, I don't believe that the second fire was Clarence. I'm absolutely convinced that Clarence Roberts died in the second fire and that some person, possibly a derelict, uh, died in, in the first fire. And when I say absolutely, I mean that this is uh, uh, not only a reasonable medical certainty, uh, but would be beyond a shadow of a doubt. Today in this small cemetery, the mystery of Clarence Roberts lies buried, still defying explanation after almost 20 years. Who was the man in the first fire? Who set the second fire and why? Who was a mysterious figure seen at Geneva's home? And why did she hide his identity? And the key question, where is Clarence Roberts? Is he in this grave? Some family members are doubtful and they protested when this headstone was put in place. Whoever it is that rests beneath this Midwestern earth will never tell his tale. Next, a Florida bank robber who has successfully robbed 30 banks. The police call him Fumbles. You'll see why in a moment. Since July 12, 1984, a robber wearing gloves and a baseball cap has held up nearly 30 banks throughout Florida. But as we will see, this felon has succeeded almost in spite of himself. For the authorities know him as Fumbles. This robber hits small suburban banks, usually in outdoor shopping malls. Besides a cap and gloves, he has another distinctive trademark. He was given the nickname early on of fumbles because in the first robbery when he came in he got inside the bank drew the weapon held it in his hand and proceeded to trip and fall the gun went uh, out of his hand and he had to kind of scrabble and pick it back up uh, which time he then proceeded with the robbery in a second robbery, fumbles even had trouble keeping his mask in place uh, approximately a month later he dropped some of the money on the way out of the bank had to stop, pick it up, and then proceed with his getaway plans. This is a robbery. The police admit to a certain amount of amusement at their adversary's clumsiness. His 30 armed robberies are no laughing matter. I think I was rather in shock. Um, I had never been robbed before. Hurry up. I did think about my children. I was going to raise my children because they were very young at the time. About two nights later, in, in bed in the middle of the night, and I was lying there alone, and my two children were one was in a crib and one was in her bed. I thought, oh my God. He pulled a gun, walked up to me, put it in my face, and said, Don't do anything stupid. Don't do anything stupid. He put a paper sack on the counter, told me to put the money in it. I put all the money in it, gave it back to him. He turned around and walked out the door. I was mad. And then I was scared, because I realized that he could have hurt me. Update, a fumbles robber has been captured. Within minutes of our broadcast, the Clearwater, Florida Police Department received a call from one of our viewers who recognized Fumbles as Ross James Preston, a 23-year-old student living in Clearwater. On May 24, 1989, FBI agents, Clearwater police officers, and Pinellas County Sheriff's deputies arrested Preston while he was test driving a pickup truck. 
The search by warrant was made of the vehicle Mr. Preston was driving when he was arrested. Inside the vehicle uh, were found a ball cap with the letters CAT on the cap. Also found were a pair of gardening gloves uh, and a pair of sunglasses and a jacket. Uh, these were very similar to items which were observed being worn by the bank robber we called Fumbles. On August 2nd, Ross James Preston admitted to committing 33 armed bank robberies, but as part of a plea bargain was charged with only seven of the holdups. He has since been sentenced to 25 years in prison. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is watching. Perhaps it's you.